to the center. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Vasuki uh, for this amazing uh, organization and conversation and the center for hosting this event. The people here, thank you for coming. And I think we have people online, so hi. Um, I'm very happy uh, that we can go back to this, to feel this energy and talking together. <clears throat> so today I... Uh, sort of journey with me uh, starting from now but then going back uh, a bit so starting point i would say june 2020 uh, this was um, italy was uh, finishing a very uh, difficult period a very uh, strict uh, lockdown and despite the emergency uh, anti-racist protests were organized everywhere in italy uh, for the, the death of George Floyd. And so black youth and new young people of color felt the urgency to go in the streets in Italy and mobilize and shout all of rage and frustration, not only in relation to the death of George Floyd, but also about the condition of black people and people of color in Italy. So why uh, this demonstration was so important for many of us? And I think it's important to take um, a step back to 2018. Uh, because 2018 for me has been a sort of pivotal year in Italy for the debates on race and identity. And so as I said, I would like to take you there, starting from now. As you know, in Italy, we just had elections, right? Um, and also in 2018, we had national elections. Italian governments don't last long. So uh, yes, we had like three, I think, between 2018 and, and 2022. Um, so the person who really won uh, these elections is um, Giorgia Meloni. Giorgia Meloni. Um, that actually i'm going to start from here this is who won 2018 election so you can see these two uh, mps luigi di maio and uh, salvini i highlighted in yellow uh, as you can see um, this little logo uh, fdi fratelli d'italia which is the party who won now the election. So in 2018, as you can see, they did 4.3%. So very, very low. While the Lega of Salvini uh, was, uh, got 17.4. Um, what happened in 2022? Well, look at the difference. Fratelli d'Italia, 26. And Lega, 8. Um, Fratelli d'Italia, the party led by Giorgia Meloni, uh, Giorgia Meloni, who I wanted to show you here, sorry, is a, a woman who defines herself uh, donna, mother, and a Christian. Uh, Fratelli d'Italia uh, is a national conservative right wing and populist party. The successor of a previous party called Alleanza Nazionale, that was the uh, got its heritage from MSI, Movimento Sociale Italiano. So, Movimento Sociale Italiano was a party created in 1946, so after the end of the war, and was led by uh, Giorgio Almirante. What does Meloni say about this, uh, uh, the creator of this party? Well, when, he, when they were celebrating the 34th anniversary of his death, talking about him, Giorgio Meloni said, Almirante, a honest and brave man, respected by his friends and opponents, someone who has transmitted to the future generations, ideas, values, and an immense love for this nation. The right doesn't forget him. Here you can see Meloni in 1996, when she joined the uh, youth uh, front of, of the party. And uh, as you can see, the color black is not uh, random, right? There is a long heritage about it. If we think about black shirts, hmm? 
And here you can see Giorgio Milante. So this brave man that is one of Giorgio Meloni's uh, heroes. So Almirante. Who was Almirante? Almirante was a journalist and the prominent figure of the historical Italian far right, a supporter of fascism, and also a supporter of the creation of the Italian Social Republic, also known as Repubblica di Salò, a so-called puppet regime led by Mussolini is sponsored by Nazi Germany, surrendered in 1945. So it was very uh, short-lived. In May 1942, Almirante, on the pages of La Difesa della Razza, wrote a pivotal article explaining the relevance of blood as the real and only proof to reclaim Italianness. And I really would like to show you uh, what he wrote. He said, racism must be the food of all and for all, if we truly want to have in Italy, alive in all of us, a conscience of the race. Our racism must be the racism of blood, the blood that I feel running in my veins, that I feel while it's flowing, that I can see, analyze, and compare with the blood of others. Otherwise, we will end up playing in the hands of the half-breeds and of the Jews. The Jews who have in so many occasions been able to change their names and successfully blend with us. There is no other certificate which will allow us to put a stop on miscegenation and Judaism, the certificate of blood. So this is Georgia Meloni's hero. Um, also, why I take you to 2018? Because 2018 was the 80th anniversary of the fascist laws that was, were enacted in uh, 1938 against Jews. And why it was a, a pivotal year? Well, because in the 80th anniversary of the racial laws, we got uh, words coming back, such as the defense of the white race, extinction of our race, and ethnic substitution. These sentences were explicitly mentioned in the Italian political discourse, along with vitriolic anti-immigrant, especially anti-black propaganda. Um, so, in light of this consideration, it's interesting to analyze the heritage of this language and how the debate on race was really uh, intertwined with the political discourse that led to two elections won by far-right movements. So 2018 started in a very um, explosive way. Um, we have Attilio Fontana. He was a candidate to become governor of the Lombardy region. And on the 15th of January 2018, so I repeat, the 80th anniversary of the racial laws, he made this de declaration about refugees and asylum seekers. He said, we cannot accept them all, because if we did, the social and ethnic reality would no longer be us, because they outnumber us, because they're more determined than us to occupy this country. We have to decide if our ethnicity, if our white race, uh, should continue to exist, or if, if it should be wiped out. It's not a question of being xenophobic or racist, but logical and rational. And he won. He's still the governor of the Lombardy region. But 2018 was a, a year marked uh, by uh, a sort of unprecedented amount of racial violence. In fact, the first six months of the year saw numerous acts of racist violence culminating in a series of shootings. And I have to say, um, shootings are not normal in Europe. Uh, in Italy, for example, nobody carries weapons unless you are a hunter or a police officer. So it's not normal to have shootings. And so um, these shootings that happened all in the same year, they were very shocking. Um, in fact, uh, the um, anti-racial discrimination national office reported that 
there was an increase by 300% in terms of racial violence. And at some point, uh, Michelle Bachelet uh, announced her intention to send UN personnel to Italy in order to evaluate uh, reports of an alarming increase of violence and racism against migrants. Anti-racist organization monitoring racism recording 14 shootings in the three months after Salvini entered the government, the majority of which involved air uh, rifles, and 628 cases of verbal and violence, uh, physical and verbal violence, discrimination, and property damage. Among the 126 recorded cases of racist physical violence, there were five deaths. And so I would like to tell you a bit what happened in 2018 and how it's connected to the state of Italy now. The first shooting uh, occurred in February, 3rd of February. So let's remember Fontana has already said our white race is about to be uh, extinct. And then we have this uh, man, Luca Traini. Uh, who on February 3rd, he took his black Alfa Romeo and he went to uh, Macerata. Macerata is a city, is a town um, uh, located in the center of Italy. In Macerata, he started hunting black bodies as targets. He shot 30 bullets in 10 different areas of the town, injuring six people, all Africans. Uh, like Wilson Kofiu Magbo, uh, 20 years old from Ghana, uh, Gideon Azeke, Omar Fadera, uh, Mamadou Touré, uh, and uh, others. So nobody died, but uh, especially Mamadou Touré, who was at 28, he had to be rushed to the intensive care with a liver hematoma. At the time of his arrest, Traini had parked uh, near a fascist monument, wrapped in the Italian, uh, wrapped in the Italian flag, and uh, he explained that he committed the shooting to avenge the murder of Pamela Mastro Pietro, an uh, 18-year-old uh, young woman whose body uh, was found uh, dismembered and placed into two suitcases. So a horrible death uh, that happened on the 30th of January, so a few days before. Pamela was recovering from heroin addiction and had run away from the rehabilitation community in which she was hosted. She arrived in Macerata and she uh, met allegedly Innocent Osegale, a 29 year old Nigerian uh, citizen who was known to deal drugs and who was arrested soon after and sentenced for life. It's important to highlight, though, that Traini's act of terror didn't focus on foreigners or uh, just immigrants, as the majority of the Italian media framed the event in the following days. Traini clearly admitted his goal, and I quote, he said, I don't deny what I've done. I wanted to eat drink, uh, drug dealers like those who sold drugs to Pamela. It's not my fault if in Macerata all the drug dealers are black. I didn't know I, I injured a woman, I just wanted to hit black men. So it was a, a very clear uh, attack. While recovering from this traumatic incident, a month later in my town, Florence, the city in which at the time I was living, uh, Roberto Pirrone shot and killed Ididien, a 54-year-old Senegalese man. Dien had migrated to Italy 20 years earlier, and on that tragic day, he happened to randomly cross the bridge um, Amerigo Vespucci to sell his merchandise to passers-by. After the shooting, Pirone turned himself to the police, declaring that he had originally planned to commit suicide. However, once he realized he couldn't shoot himself, he decided to fire to a random target, as he said, in order to spend the rest of his life in prison. Yet, CCTV footage show how this alleged randomness seemed in fact quite selective as several people walked on that bridge and the only life seen as acceptable was the one of a black man. Three months later, another shooting, 2nd of June. And this time is another African man, uh, Sumaila Sako. Sumaila Sako was 29 years old, he came from Mali. 
he was working as a migrant agricultural laborer, so picking tomatoes and fruit in the, in the south of Italy. And he was also a trade unionist and an activist, a human rights defender. So on that day in June, Sacco was collecting scrap metal from an abandoned factory in order to help a couple of co-workers to build a shack in the tent city where he was living in Calabria. The factory had been closed years earlier and seized by the police following an accusation uh, of hazardous waste being illegally dumped on the site. Antonio Pontoriero, whose uncle was among the implicated people, had unofficially assumed control of the land. And so when he saw Tumaila Sacco on the 2nd of June with his friends, he shot at them, sat from his car with an illegally possessed firearm. Two of the three men managed to escape, but Sacco died of a trauma resulting from uh, a bullet. Initially, in the hours following the murder, National News Agency spread the news that the murder of Sacco would have been a reaction to an alleged theft. On that occasion, Salvini uh, promptly condemned Traini's gesture, affirming that anyone committing such an act is a crimi criminal, regardless of their skin color, yet, adding, it's clear and evident that out of control immigration and invasion like the one organized, wanted and financed in these years by the left leads to social conflict. So by saying this, Almini intimate, insinuated that the alleged invasion of immigrants orchestrated by the left had led Italians to an unbearable level of exasperation and Tony's gesture was the inevitable consequence. Also, uh, when uh, Sumaila Sacco died, for example, on the 2nd of June, he had just been elected uh, vice deputy prime minister and minister of the interior. He declared from Padova, the party is over for illegal immigrants. Get ready to pack in a polite and calm manner, but they have to go. Associating the, the, the black migrants to criminals. But what I notice in that period is how um, women's body and women's reproductive uh, capabilities were strategically uh, employed by the political discourse in conjunction with, with ideas of race and identity. Um, so, Ignazio Benito Maria La Russa, already his name tell us something, right? Um, now, he is he's part of Fratelli d'Italia. He got, I think, the second more, more important role in the, in, the, in the parliament. He's uh, the head of the Senate that's been elected, he's been nominated a few days ago. And here you can see uh, Giorgia Meloni congratulating him uh, on, uh, on Twitter. Ignazio Benito Maria La Russa uh, came from a family of fascist tradition and joined, age 24, the Youth Front, the Fronte della Gioventù, the youth section of the post-fascist party I was telling you earlier, the Movimento Sociale Italiano, guided by Almirante. So one of the main um, topics of discussion during the electoral campaign was the... Um, the bill to change the citizenship law in Italy. So as you may know, some of you may know in Italy, uh, citizenship is transmitted by blood and not by soil. So it means that if you were born by Italian parents, regardless where you were born, you are Italian by blood because you have Italian blood. But if you were born in Italy by non-Italian parents, you are legally a foreigner. So you're not Italian until the age of 18. Uh, until the age of 18, you need a visa. Uh, you need to renew a visa. And when you're 18, you need to apply for citizenship. And you have only 12 months to apply for that. It's a very long uh, process. Uh, the waiting time before Salvini was two years, and then Salvini doubled to four years. So you apply when you're 18, and you need to wait four years to have a response. Obviously, if you have a lawyer, the time is shorter, but it's a very bureaucratic uh, procedure because you also need to show that you have continuously lived in Italy and that you communicate every change of address. So some people prefer to wait to be 28 and be naturalized Italian citizens. So this uh, law is often a contentious issue 
strategically and I would say in, used in, in, in a sort of opportunistic way by the right and the left as a, as a, as a topic of uh, political consensus. So also in 2018, in 2017, so during the pre-electoral campaign, citizenship was a very contentious um, uh, problem. And so uh, La Russa, this gentleman behind me, I noticed that uh, he had, was invited in many TV programs discussing this specific uh, law and why, uh, explaining why he was so against this law. Because he said, if we do that, if we allow people who were born here to be Italian, well, Italy will become Africa's delivery room. La sala parto dell'Africa. So, he insinuated that the bill, if we change the law and transform you sanguinis, so the right of blood, into you solely the right of land, uh, storms of African women will arrive in Italy, deliver their babies, who by law will be Italian. This was not what the bill uh, was uh, proposing, actually, uh, was quite different from reality. But he was going around and saying this, the, um, La sala parto dell'Africa. For example, once he said to justify his thought, if I went working abroad and I happened to have a son there, I wouldn't consider it my right to have an American son or an English son or a Nigerian son. I would wait for a few years so he could decide if he wants my citizenship or the acquired one. Children don't necessarily need to get mad. They go to school and they can be proud of their own citizenship. It's wrong to say that they can pass a random course to acquire Italian citizenship. A child born here to foreign parents in which the mother too is a long-term resident, otherwise, and then he shouts, Italy will, uh, um, Italy will become Africa's delivery room. They come here, they give birth, they find a random guy who pretends to be the father. And so I was thinking about these very vitriolic and violent uh, words. They come here, these women come here, they give birth to their black babies and they find someone who pretends to be the father in order to scrounge up the generosity of Italian citizenship promoted by the left. And it's interesting that he was talking about pregnant women because the pregnant body is a specific body shaped by a number of social practices and regu regulatory processes allowing specific form of surveillance by the state. So this scrutinization and surveillance seem particularly pronounced with when the pregnant body is also a racialized body, considered alien, not belonging to the nation, and therefore potentially able to contaminate the purity of the nation. And so I was thinking about all of this on February 9th, 2018, when I heard the story of a young Nigerian woman called Beauty, one of those who, according to La Russa, come here, gives birth, birth and then finds someone to pass off as the father. Beauty was a 31-year-old Nigerian woman coming from Africa indeed and pregnant, so the perfect candidate to confirm the effectiveness of La Russa's model. However, Beauty didn't need to find a fictitious partner to justify her presence in Italy because she arrived with her husband called Destiny. What La Russa didn't contemplate in his tirades in the various TV program uh, was that beauty, in Beauty's case, for example, Beauty's pregnant body, allegedly using Italy as a delivery room, was also a uh, sick body ravaged by a terminal illness. Beauty and Destiny had left Nigeria four years earlier, and they had reached the coast of Italy by boat uh, from Libya. They used to live in Naples, however, with the deterioration of her illness, they decided to go to France to see Beauty's sister in order to have a more stable situation. Although Beauty was documented, her husband was not. He was still an asylum seeker, so he couldn't leave Italy. And they try to cross the border by land, so they take a coach and they try to cross the border with France on February 9th. 
So February 9th, north of Italy, France, it means very cold. Mm? They are stopped by the gendarme. Beauty, who could have carried on the trip, decided to stay with her husband and they're brought back to Italy at the train station in Bardonecchia at around two in the morning, despite her advanced state of pregnancy and serious uh, respiratory issues caused by the illness and the cold. Here, a local NGO took them closer to a hospital to be later transferred to um, a hospital in Turin. In Torino. Uh, given Beauty's determination to save the fetus, doctors begin an experimental phase of chemotherapy. Nevertheless, a month later, during her 29th week of pregnancy, Beauty gave birth to a 700 gram fetus by emergency C section, and she dies shortly after. So it may seem Italy offered Beauty a delivery room, but from that room, she never came out. Listening to La Russa's declaration, it became clear how the senator conveniently forgot to mention Italy's historical presence in East Africa and how many Italians, how many Italian men made use of Africa as a pornotropic, to use a McClintock definition, namely a fantastic magic lantern of the mind onto which Europe projected its forbidden sexual desire and fears the quintessential zone of sexual aberration and abnormality. So just to, to give you some ideas, um, in 1905, uh, the first colony is Eritrea in, 19, uh, in 1890. In uh, 1905, there are approximately 2,000 Italians living in the, in the colony. And as you can see, there are many men, but very few women only 482 and 73 only not married. Uh, many were religious, uh, like nuns. So there were uh, many uh, relationships, sexual relationships going on. Um, and then you can see how in 1931, the population has doubled and so the children, the mixed race children. In fact, in 1931, the census tell us that one third of the children born in the colony is mixed, Italian, Africa. 1938, uh, the population is very high because uh, there had been the invasion of Ethiopia, so many soldiers were sent to the front, and the abandoned rate was 50%. 1946, uh, another document tells us there are 6,000 fatherless children in the colony. And so considering this, one may ponder who treated which country as a delivery room. But going back to Pamela and beauty. So in both beauty and Pamela's cases, one may notice the use of women's bodies that are gendered and racialized to build a complex discourse on the nation and nationalism. In the case of Pamela, in fact, her body, her white body, seemed to incarnate the body of the nation, dismembered, uh, raped. And uh, Traini want to avenge Pamela, and uh, it seemed that symbolically Pamela represents Italy. And so the havoc that black men uh, do, uh, did to Pamela is the havoc black men do to Italy. So the random killing of black men symbolizes the avenge of the violence performed on Pamela's body by innocent Osegale. The innocence and purity of Pamela were heavily emphasized by certain media, for example, media uh, targeting social uh, media users. Um, the online newspaper Fun Page, for example, published an article in June portraying Pamela as a young and thin woman, victim of her borderline personality disorder, which caused her addiction to heroin and irrational, irrational sexual promiscuity. They say a young and petite 18 year old, big eyes and the fringe of straight brown uh, hair covering her forehead. Pamela is a restless girl suffering with a borderline personality disorder that makes her a slave of drugs. And then there is beauty's uh, black pregnant body, a dangerous body able to potentially contaminate the purity of the nation due to its reproductive function, if not accurately monitored and restricted by the state. 
women's bodies are not just organic material, rather they, be, they can be considered political fields on which the state inscribes social messages. Therefore, the rigid control of immigration reflects the fear of the invasion of other ethnic groups, potentially capable of obliterating the uniqueness of the nation. In this context, laws regulating the access to citizenship are particularly important, given that these allow foreigners to join the nation. Yuval Davis illustrates how women are biological and cultural reproducer of national ethnic collectivity, and they've been historically stimulated or discouraged to procreate with certain groups or um, uh, to, to discourage to procreate with certain ethnic groups. Not only do women have to be attentive of their own potentially contaminating sexuality, but also of their own reproductive capacity since their children will be the new members of the nation. Consequently, uh, the use of restrictive laws concerning the transmission of citizenship. And I'm about to conclude. I go back to June 2020. So in those days, um, I couldn't help but ask myself a few questions. In Italy, many white people appear to have felt an urgent need, sudden urgent need for an anti-racist justice, considering the mm, demonstration across the nation organized in record time. Instead, many black people and people of color were experiencing a profound sense of rage and frustration. The most obvious question that um, many of us were uh, thinking of was, where were you before? Why did the death of George Floyd cause this feeling of disdain, pain, demand for civil rights, for a, man, a black man killed on the other side of the ocean? And why has this anger not been shown or used to organize demonstration of solidarity when black people have been killed in Italy too? That night of June, uh, June the 2nd, those questions were haunting me and preventing me from sleeping. The visibility of the Black Lives Matter helped certainly to revitalize this struggle, but are different struggles too. And the demand for a reform of Italian citizenship is, is still a pending and heated issues of uh, argument. And also, I believe that when we say Black Lives Matter in Italy, we cannot only think about those who were born in Italy or those who arrived as documented. We have to remember the lives of those crossing the Mediterranean or those kept in deportation center due to lacking the right passport. As often, not even the passport is enough. It was deeply unsettling for me to think what would have happened on that day in February in Macerata if I, a black Italian, had accidentally crossed paths with Luca Traini during his murderous rampage against black people. Would I still be here today reading these words? And what if I had been the one on the other bridge on Berigo Vespucci that I used to cross on a daily basis? Whether one was born in Rome or Dakar, racist violence affects us in Italy and our loved ones in a way or another. Nonetheless, this is a struggle that must unite all of us. And it is only through the creation of robust and durable alliances that we can ever hope to unearth the hidden roots of power and dismantle the system of structural oppression that have grown from them. Thank you. Thank you.